Now, in we were just in Matthew chapter five. We have one more verse there, and then we're going to get on into the body of the teaching. In Matthew chapter five, verse thirteen, he said, "You are the salt of the earth." We just talked about that. In verse fourteen, he said, "You are the light of the world." He said, "A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid." Verse fifteen: Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Verse sixteen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Yes. Now, notice, this is exactly the opposite of what many times is taught in the church. Because we all know the Bible talks about when you give, don't do it for a show. When you, when you do these things, don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. And we know that that has to do with a, a kind of a humility type thing and not you know, doing things to be seen. But this is not that. Here he said, let your light so shine. And then he's going to describe what that light is and how that light shines. Now we know that the light that's shining is the life that is in you through the Spirit of God. Amen? Now, Notice, though, here it says, that let your light so shine before men. So men have to see your light. Now, how do they see your light? Well, you know, I'm just, I just let the presence of God rest on me. And <clears throat> when they get near me, they should see my light in me. They should see that I'm happy. They should see that. And there's truth to the joy of God being seen on you. There's truth to, to the fact that the Spirit of God emanates from you. That when people get around you, they can sense it at times, all right? But that, most of that has to do with how sensitive they are to the Spirit, yeah. right? So if you get somebody who is spiritually dead, they're not going to sense nothing, right? If anything, they may sense something what they would consider weird, yeah. right? What, what is that? I feel, you know. <laughs> so he's not talking about that per se. Now watch, he says... Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. So your good works is letting your light shine. Right? As you do good works, that is letting your light shine. Now, good works are not works that are geared toward gaining you favor with God. Right? Those are called dead works. Right? And that's what we are to repent from is the dead works of trying to gain God's favor, doing things to gain God's favor. Now, I've talked about that many times in the DHT, concerning even worship. It's sad that worship has become, to a, to a large degree, nothing more than a manipulation to get God to show up. And whenever you, you are using worship to get God to show up, now you're not really worshiping, you are manipulating. So it's not true worship. True worship is a gush, it, actually even the words, means a gushing forth not a manipulation to get something back, right? Even the very word worship comes from the root word of where a dog licks a hand of its master, right? Now, that's not a real flattering picture, but nevertheless, that's where it came from. And the idea is that when a dog licks your hand, he, he has no idea of reward back. He is doing it out of love, gratitude, that kind of thing. And so that's one of the problems is that we do a lot of things Many times people use fasting, they use prayer, they use worship to try to manipulate God to get him to show up. And none of those things are supposed to be used as manipulation. They should be done to help you get out of yourself, get away from yourself, and die to the old man, as we would say, and to start to live unto God, to get you into position. It's not that, okay, if I fast, God will see me fasting and say, if you fast three days, I'll give you this. If you fast... 40 days, I'll give you that. That's not the way it works. The fasting is getting you out of yourself so that you are in a position that God can flow through you. Amen? Do you understand that? It's, it's not a, to get him to do something. It's to get you into a position so that he can actually do what he already wants to do. Okay? Now, but, it's, but it should never be looked at as a reward. That, that's the thing. Don't, you're not doing it to get rewarded. Power is not a reward. Right? The ability to heal the sick is not a reward. It's all by grace. Okay? None of us in here deserves to be used by God to heal the sick. Right? And none of us in here deserves to be healed. 
on our own merit by whatever we do, no matter what you do. Whether you give an offering or fast or prayer or anything else, you don't deserve to be healed, right? The only reason any person, quote unquote, deserves to be healed is because of what Jesus did. So Jesus deserves us to be healed because he paid the price for it. Amen? So you're getting healed is not what you do. It's not based on what you do. You getting healed is based on what Jesus did, and he deserves you to be healed. Amen? Amen? Because he does not deserve to bear those stripes for nothing. Amen? So you just got to get your thoughts in the right direction. Okay? Now, so he said that you may, that, that they, these men may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And notice, the works that they see you doing should glorify God. Almost all of the teachings in the church that have to do with power, anointing, gifts, all that, ends up glorifying a person, right? Not even the body of Christ, but a person. It ends up exalting a man. If I can fast long enough, God will anoint me with this gift, right? And it takes it away from Jesus, takes it away from God. God is not glorified. God doesn't get the glory. People will always come in and then they say, how did you do that? Oh, well, I fasted. Oh, see, uh, no attention on God. It's all on what you did to get it. Amen? And then, oh, you fasted, you prayed, you did this. And it exalts a man, puts a man on a pedestal, and almost totally negates the grace of God in it, or the goodness of God. So, you notice, he said, <clears throat> I think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. Now this, again, we've been talking about grace a little bit here, and this is not going to be a seminar based on that aspect. But I do want to point this out while we're here. He says, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. All right? Now, we've made a big deal over the fact, oh, there's no law for the Christian. There's no law for this. You know, we're not under law. Okay, that's true. However, now notice I didn't say but. I said however. Okay? <clears throat> the Bible says, that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to all who believe, right? It did not say Christ was the end of the law, right? It says Christ was the end of the law for righteousness. In other words, you can't use the law to be righteous. If, if righteousness came by the law, then we wouldn't have needed a new covenant. We would have had the law, right? But righteousness comes through Jesus Christ. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So it's not according to how you live perfectly, but he didn't say that he took away the law. He, now, it, matter of fact, it even tells us that we will fulfill the law. And the way we fulfill the law, because when we were not born again, and even under the old covenant, they could not walk in the righteousness of God, but they walked in the law of God, and they were accounted righteous. They weren't righteous, but they were accounted as righteous, okay? Because living by the law didn't make you righteous. But now in the new covenant, through the grace of God, now we are accounted as righteous, and because of that, now we can fulfill the law by we don't keep the law in the sense of going back and saying, okay, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But if we love God, love our neighbor, and do to them what we would have done to us, then we will not be violating any of the law. The whole law can be summed up in that. Love God, love your neighbor, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's it. So you are fulfilling the law. You're just not going by the letter of the law. You are fulfilling the spirit of the law because of the spirit that lives in you, and you do it naturally because the law is written in your heart. Amen? Amen? Now, this 10-minute this section here should be the balance of law and grace in the church, right? And I would advise you, if you get these CDs or DVDs, whatever, go over this, study this out, go into it. We'll talk more about it as we go on. But... The only reason I'm bringing that up is because there is such a, the pendulum has swung so far to the other side that people are being led into a ditch and it's going to cost people their salvation. Very simply. Now, here he says, <clears throat> I've not come to destroy but to fulfill. Now, in, I want to go on to, uh, go to page 10 of the manual. 
which is going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 5. These are the basics. We're still kind of in the introductory phase of this teaching. We're going to get into good stuff here pretty quick, right? So hang on there. But we have to get you solid in why this is true for you. Now, I guess I should start this with a, an altar call, right? Because if you're not born again, then pretty much nothing I will be saying will apply to you, right? So if you're not born again and you want to get born again, then wonderful. You, you don't even have to come down front to do it. You can do it right where you are, right? And if, if, if at some point you're here and you're not born again or you are away from God or whatever terminology you want to use, then at some point, even while I'm teaching this, you say, you know, that's for me. Then that's all you got to do pretty much. And then, Jesus, I make you my Lord. And all of a sudden now you're in, right? And then the, everything else you'll hear will apply to you, right? Isn't that easy? Flipping a switch. Believing is just flipping a switch. Amen? So, I'll just let you know about that. So, everything I'm going to be speaking about during these next three days has to do with born-again people. People who have the Spirit of Christ. The Bible says if you have not the Spirit of Christ, then you're none of His. So, I'm talking about people that are born again, and in their spirit, their spirit has been recreated. Well, let's, let's just read it. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is... A new creature, right? Didn't say he's going to be someday. If you're in Christ, you're a new creature. So when did the new creature part happen? When you came into Christ, right? So the moment of your new birth, you were instantly changed into this new creature. Uh, I always quote one translation that says, a new species of being that never existed before. Isn't that amazing? Think about that. Now, if it says a new species of being that never existed before, now think about that. That means before there was a new creature, before there could be a new creation, this is such a new species that there was, it was never in existence before. So now if you are this new creature, then that means you can't go back and use old creatures as your example. Amen? Now, I'm not saying, and, and I have to be very, we're going to be doing this the whole time. I'm going to be making disclaimers and or qualifications and all this kind of stuff, all right? Because I'm going to be very specific. When you are born again, that new creature does not have to look back at Elijah to find out how to please God, Amen. right? Now, what I mean by that, you say, well, but Hebrews says, you know, follow them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Yeah, follow the faith of them, right? You follow, it was their faith that pleased God. It was not their actions and their rituals and the things they did, right? If, if you're going to try to do that with Moses, you've got to go to the Sinai Desert somewhere and find a cleft in the rock to hide in until the glory passes by you, right? If you're going to try to do... We can't do that. So we don't follow their actions. We follow their faith. And if we see their faith in actions, we have to decipher the principle of faith that they were walking in and live by that. Amen? But instead, the church wants to go back, for instance, I'm talking about old covenant people, and I'm going to use somebody in the Gospels. Because you have to realize that until Jesus died, all the Gospels were still old covenant. Right? The, the new covenant did not start in Matthew 1.1. Right? It actually started in Matthew 26. Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. That's when it started. Before then, he was proclaiming a coming kingdom. But, but he was proclaiming it to old covenant people who still kept the law, who still went to the temple, who still made animal sacrifices, who still did all that. Right? So that is not you. Amen? Now, if you're going to try to live old covenant, you're going to try to go back and do what Elijah did and what Moses did, then you better stock up on the animals. <laughs> right? Because whenever you, whenever you mess up, you're going to have to take some offering down here, and I'm sure pastor's not going to appreciate the blood of the animal on the altar up here, all right? So you can't do that, right? That's not you. And when you do that, or when you, and of course you're not going to be killing animals, I know that. But what I'm saying is what counts is that when you try to do these things and you try to go back under the law, well, the, the idea with the law was you had to kill an animal to pay the penalty. So if you're going to go back under the law, you have to kill animals. So if you're not going to kill animals, don't go back under the law. And when you try to go back under the law and you start killing animals, now you're saying the, the blood of those animals is more valuable than the blood of Jesus. Right? That's what Paul was talking about in Hebrews, if you believe it was Paul that wrote Hebrews. I personally do. But 
in, Paul, in Hebrews, he said, that's why it's impossible once you have been enlightened and received the goodness of God and tasted it, that you should go back and sin willfully. Now, there, it's impossible that you would be able to come back to salvation because you are trodden underfoot the blood of Christ. He wasn't talking about you going out and smoking, right? He wasn't talking about you going out and getting drunk as far as the sinning willfully. He was talking about you going back under the law as your mode of righteousness, right? Now, you shouldn't go out and smoke. You shouldn't go out and drink. I have to, you know, again, clarify all these things, okay? But what is even worse than drinking and smoking is going back under the law, okay? Because for the other things, you get forgiveness for. But you go back into the law, you are, you are discounting the blood of Christ, and there's no forgiveness for that. Now, I'm not saying that you can't turn around and come back to Christ, but I'm saying as long as you're under the law, then there is no forgiveness. Right? The law did not, no person under the law was ever forgiven. Their sins were not forgiven. They were atoned. They were held. They were still there. They were covered, not forgiven. Amen? Your sins are not covered. Your sins are remitted. You are a new creature. When the devil says, remember when you used to go out drinking? Mm-mm. No. See, that's why most of you, if you're going to really walk with God, many of you would probably have to move from your hometown. Because all you're ever going to do is be surrounded by people who go, I remember you when you used to go to nightclub. I remember you when you used to, you know, get drunk down on my road. Right? Honestly, if I had not moved from my hometown, I, I almost guarantee you I would not be doing what I'm doing today. I would not have walked with God the way I have been. Why? Because everybody there knew me after the flesh. They knew me from my martial arts. They knew me from my nightclub dancing stuff. That's where they knew me. And I, to this day, I can go back up there and I still run into people. I remember you. You know? And then they want to start talking about the old days. And I'm like, you know. and it's kind of funny because now I've gotten to a point where I don't care. I don't know these people anymore. Right? They don't pay my bills. So I don't owe them anything. You know, what I mean? you know what I mean? I don't have to go along with them. I tell them, I don't know who you're talking about. You don't remember those days? Remember that? No, nope, don't remember any of that. No. Oh, oh, I know who you're talking about. He's dead. <laughs> you're, you're confusing me with somebody else. <laughs> and you ought to see the look. They look at you like, really? I'm like, yeah, he's dead. You didn't hear? Oh, he died a horrible death. <laughs> right? All right? It was, I mean, he struggled for years trying to live. Dying the whole time. Amen. <laughs> I finally killed him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you're going to have to make that break and start seeing yourself different because God sees you different. Amen. Amen? Amen. So, and when you see yourself different, you'll talk different. If you're still talking the same way you used to talk, you still see yourself the same way you used to see yourself. Simple as that. So, he says here, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Now notice, old things are passed away. Not, not old things are going to pass away. Amen? Now, you might want to make a note somewhere if you have a notepad or even in your manual there. We're going to, almost everything we're going to be talking about is going to be dealing with past tense. If you want to understand the Bible, always note the tense of what's being said. Always. All right? And it, almost everything from Romans, especially Romans on in the epistles, everything is past tense. Everything, right? Now, he says here, old things are passed away. Not, thing, not old things are going to pass away. So something old has passed away. Well, what's old has passed away is your old man. Your old man has passed away, right? That's what Paul said. My old man was crucified with Christ, Amen. right? That's what's passed away. Behold, look, take notice. All things are become new. Not all things are going to become new. So a change took place, and we know that, and we can talk about this change in several different ways. We can talk about being translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. We can talk about these things being translated, being changed, being born again. We can talk about it being received in the spirit of Christ. All of these are all synonyms basically for the same thing. But this change that took place when you got born again, that's the beauty of this. When you, now, we're, and we're going to be looking in just a minute more about spirit, soul, and body, because this is key. You are a spirit, right? right. What, what I see is not you, right? Any more than if right now I see the clothes you're wearing. But tomorrow, probably, you'll wear different clothes, right? And, and if I don't, you know, if I see you at a distance, maybe from the back, and you're wearing different clothes, I might not know it's you. Right? So those clothes are not you. 
They're just the clothes you put on. Well, the body, what, you, what I see here is not you. That's just what you are wearing. Yes. Right? Because the real you is the spirit. Now, the, now, once you get this, and I'm not talking about just semantics here. I'm not talking about just a way of talking. But once you realize you are a spirit, you probably heard it said this way. It's the way I was taught it originally. You, you are a spirit. You have a soul. And you live in a body. Amen? But the body, isn't it funny? You say anything that you can say you're about is not you. Yeah. Right? If someone said, Curry, is that your Yukon out there? Yep, sure is. That's my Yukon. Okay? And, but that Yukon is not me. It is mine, right? Now, if you say, man, my back is giving me pain. My foot is needing this. You're not saying that, that's you. My. And when you say my, that means what you own, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break this down very, very simply. It's going to sound ridiculously simple, okay? But you have to realize your body is not you. If your body is not you, but it is what you are using and what you have been given. See, if your body is you, when we put you in the ground, when you die, then you're dead. Yeah. Right? And that's where it ceases. And if that's where it ceases, then this the whole thing is a waste. Right? Then it's all about right here. But we know that the real you is the spirit and that continues living. Yeah. Isn't that right? right? March 11th, actually March, well, March 11th, my dad passed away this year. We buried him on March 15th. I, I preached a funeral. People had a problem with me preaching his funeral. They thought, are you going to be able to do that? And all this kind of stuff. Well, I'm an only child. Yeah, we were close. Yeah, but I, I stood in front of people because some of the people there were not saved. And I told them, I said, if I thought that that body in that box there was my dad, there's no way I can stand here without breaking down, without crying, without all this stuff. I said, but I know that's not him. That, that there's no difference from what's lying in that box than from what is hanging in his closet. It's just the body. It's just used for a time. Just as I, if, if I get these clothes dirty, I'm going to take them off, throw them in the dirty clothes, right? And put on new ones. That's all that happens when you die. Your body's wore out, your body's whatever. And you just lay it down, but you still live. Amen? Amen? Now, of all people, we Christians, not should just understand this, we ought to walk in this. That's how we can rejoice at a funeral and not mourn. Right? Because he made it. I know where my dad is. There's no doubt. We've talked. We've, I know. He made it. We should rejoice on that. Now, now, any sadness would be because, yeah, I miss him. I can't pick up the phone and call him anymore. You know, and I didn't realize till after he was gone how many times I used to pick up the phone and call him. You know, and it's like, yeah, I need to do that. Oh, I can't. Yeah, you know, I need to call my dad and ask him about that. Oh, I can't. You know, that's the sadness part. But the sadness is on my end. He's where I'm wanting to be. Right? So the sadness is, is for me. I'm really being selfish. Because for him, if I was thinking of him, I'm, I would rejoice because he's got it great. He, he's with my daughter. Right? I, I, I told him the other day after the funeral, I said, you know, I never thought he would be the first one to see my daughter again. You know, I'd never thought about it like that. But I know he's with, you know, people we know and love. So, but you have to get that concept down that this is real. This isn't play. This is not a make-believe, you know, that we just play church. No, this is real. We are spirits. We have a soul. Now, our soul has to be renewed. Until it's renewed, it works against us. Now, it, to be renewed, it has to be renewed here. Uh, Romans 12, 1 through 3 says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your, your bodies. You present your bodies. You hear that? He didn't say that you present yourself. He said that you present your body. In other words, it'd be like me. Okay, if I presented my Bible, then it's me making a choice to go, here is my Bible. Right? Now, I'm presenting my Bible. But it, so if I'm going to present my body, then that means I make a choice to present my body, something I own, to God, right? To be used by God, to be holy and blameless, right? Like, like uh, well, Roman says it too. But I present my body to God, right? And it, and it says, which is my reasonable service. That's reasonable. That's not extraordinary. That's not some high level. That's reasonable that I would present my body to God, right? Holy and blameless. And, it, and he said, and that we be not 
conform to this world, but that we be transformed by the renewing of the mind. We try to get changed every way under the sun in the church, even to the point where every way we have tried has not worked. So now we've went to the world and we brought in psychological counseling. That's all we've done. We've gone to the world and now we're trying to do the things they did because the things we did in the church did not work. So now we go to the world and try to do the things they do and that doesn't work either. The only way you are told that you will ever be transformed is by the renewing of your mind to this word. That's the only way. There's not hands laying on you does not transform you. It may heal you, may bless you, but it does not transform you. The only way you're transformed is by the renewing of your mind. Now, to the degree that your life looks like this word, looks like the life of Jesus, to that degree, your mind is renewed. And to that degree, your life is transformed. Right? So to whatever degree your life still looks like your old life, that shows how much of your mind is still not renewed. Amen? Because when your mind is renewed, you're going to look like this book. You're going to talk like this book. You're going to have the mind of Christ operating in you. Now, you already have the mind of Christ, but you're, it's not allowed to work freely in you because it has to go through here first, right? See, we always say, and if you've been in the DHD, you've heard me say this. In the church, we say, well, I have <clears throat> head knowledge. It needs to become heart knowledge, and it's exactly the opposite. Your heart has all the knowledge it needs. Your heart was created right. It was recreated by God. God did that. You didn't do that. You gave God permission to recreate you, right? So when you gave God permission to recreate you, he did it. You had nothing to do with it other than by giving him permission. That's all. You keep your hands off, he changed you. Now, then he said, you renew your mind. That's the part you do, right? God did that. It's perfect. If you put your hand into it, you're going to mess it up, right? But he said, now, you renew your mind to this word. Now, as you renew the mind, now your life will start to line up. It's like I said before, it's like this. But as you renew your mind, it lines up, and now what's in here can flow through here. So you really don't have head knowledge that needs to become heart knowledge. What you have is heart knowledge that needs to become head knowledge. Amen? That's the reality of it. Now, and just because you know about something doesn't mean you know it. Right? Knowing about it, until you live it, you don't know it. Okay? You know about it. But once you start living it, now you know it. Right? Now, he says here, old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If any man, that means you, me, or anyone, is in Christ, in union with, and considers Christ's accomplishments as done in his behalf, that man is a new creature, a new species of being. The old things of what you were and how you acted are passed away. Just like a person passes away and are no longer a part of their being. Now we are to look at and consider that all things that are in you and of you are brand new and were not there before you were born again. All right? Now, remember, you are a spirit. You have a soul that must be renewed. And you live in a body. Now, you're basically threefold. Now, you need three to have a majority. Right? Usually what happens is a person gets born again. They don't renew their mind or they renew their mind to the wrong thing. Okay? They renew it to religion as opposed to the Bible. And, and then their body is trained. Your body will do whatever you tell it to do. And your body has been trained through years of natural living to be a natural person. So your body automatically has a tendency toward earthly, worldly type things. Your spirit is of God. Your body is as much of the world as it can get. Your soul is the in-between. You, as you renew your mind, now see, when you get born again, you're, you're really only one-third right, right? Your spirit's right, but your soul hadn't changed a whole lot, and your body still has tendencies to do whatever it used to do. <clears throat> when I walk into a, a convenience store, even if I've never been there before, it's amazing. I almost don't even have to look around to find out where the cook machine is, you know, the Coke box. My body is drawn to it, right? It will go automatically there. And if I've been there a lot of times, I don't even, I can be on the phone, I can do anything, and I will go right to the Coke, right, I mean, right, not just where the sodas are, I'm talking about where the Coke is, right? I'll go right to it, right? Why? Because there is muscle memory, there is body memory, my body has been trained, right? <clears throat> so when you get born again, you've got your body and your soul 
actually working against your spirit because these two are still worldly. Your body is totally worldly. Your soul is on the fence. You know, wants to do good, doesn't know to do good, thinks this is right. If it does bad, has to pay penance, has to do something to try to make up for it. You know, and it's kind of like as a kid, you say, well, I don't want to mow the yard, but I'll clean my room. It, like you're going to negotiate, you know. Well, I messed up here, so I'll do this to make up for it. That doesn't work that way, right? Now, when, because your spirit is born again, it's right with God. As you renew your mind, and see, like I said, there's three parts. You have to have two to have a majority against the three. Well, right now, it's body and soul against the spirit. That's why many times, and even Paul talked about, I, I don't do the things I want to do. Why? Because at that point, you think Paul walked in everything he knew? No, he was learning this and had to walk into it himself. And he would receive it as a revelation. And, then, and the worst place to be in is having revelation you're not walking in. That is as close to hell on earth as you can get. Because you know better and your, your desire in your heart is to do this, but your soul and your body works against you. So, but the more you get your mind renewed, now it starts tipping in the other way. And pretty soon now your mind thinks right and your body says, oh, we want to do this. And your, body, and, and your soul says, no, we're going to pray. And your body says, well, I don't want to pray. I want to watch this television program. No, we're going to pray. And it'll argue with you. Right? And then, but the more your soul is... Because see, your spirit, your spirit don't want to watch television. Your spirit wants to commune with God. That's what your spirit wants to do. And so if you're wanting to do these other things, it's because that's the part that has not been renewed to that degree. Now, you have the two against the one. The, the, spirit, the uh, body and soul against the spirit. So you have to renew the soul so now it tips in favor of the spirit. Now when your mind is renewed to the word of God, now you think with a spiritual mind. You start thinking like God. You think like Jesus. You talk like Jesus. The mind of Christ starts to come alive in you. And now when your body says, oh, let's do this, that your body may say that. But at the same time, now you're both your spirit and your soul at the same time, both of you, just like two parents talking to a kid. No. We both say no. You know, and then your body's like, well, you know, and it wants to throw a fit, right? It wants to throw a temper tantrum, you know? And so you have to start to renew the mind. Now, that's what this is about, is to renew the mind to that. But now, realize the real you is not your body, right? The real you is what? The spirit. The soul is the border area that has to be renewed, hopefully in favor of the spirit. So now the spirit and soul are working together against the body. And then eventually you can train the body to where the, you, can, you can train the body spiritually to where instead of wanting to pick up a beer, it wants to lay hands on people. Isn't that amazing? Why? That's because now you have trained it. But that training usually comes after the renewal of the soul. Right? Because till then it doesn't even know to lay hands on the sick. Okay? Now... As you start to, to live this out, now remember, you are a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body. I know you've heard this before, and I know I'm, I'm repeating it, but I, I want to really hit on this because this will help you when it comes to healing. You know, I'm, I know healing isn't everything, but it is a big thing to a lot of people, especially sick people, right? It's really big to sick people. So when you, I, I really want you to think about this. When you were born again, old things passed away, all things become new. Now, the next verse, verse 18, says, And all things are of God. What all things? All the things that are new. So everything in your spirit is of God. Amen? There is nothing in your spirit that is not of God. God recreated you. He created you perfect and complete in Christ. Right? Again, I will show you the scriptures from this in just a few minutes. Or during the seminar anyway. Now, the key to this is this. Number one, that means that any work you're going to be doing on yourself is not going to be working on your spirit. It's going to be working on your soul. Amen? So forget this idea of getting this added to your spirit or this added thing and this, that thing. No, it's not that. It is you're going to be changing your soul. That's the area you're working on. Your spirit is perfect. The reason we know this is because if, you, if you're right with God, Born again, if you drop dead right now, where are you going to go? Be with Jesus, right? Well, now, if there is still evil in you, in your spirit, because your body doesn't go to be with Jesus, right? It's your spirit. So if there is still evil in you, you're not going to go be with him because there's no evil in heaven, right? Or no evil in his presence, right? So that means that what's in you, the spirit has to be created perfect and complete. That means there's no evil in your spirit, so that's done. So all the work you're going to be doing on yourself now is to renew the mind. That's where the problem is, right? Your only problem is your mind, okay? Not the other stuff. Now, not, not in the spirit. Now, what that means, too, is this. Whenever you are sick, 
what hurts? Is it your spirit? Is it your soul? Well, your soul gets affected, but it doesn't hurt. It's your body, right? Now, that means, for instance, uh, recently we had to change out a transmission in our Tahoe. Now, when that Tahoe was sitting in the shop getting the transmission changed, did that affect me? No. Why? Because it wasn't me. Right? It's a car I owned. Right? So now, think about this. If you are spirit and your body is something you own, then you cannot be sick. Amen? I'm not saying your body can't get sick. Your body can get sick. Right? I'm saying you. We have to differentiate between you and your body. So people say, well, when you get sick, you ought to say, I'm, what the Bible even says, you know, let the weak say I'm strong. Well, it's the same thing. People say, well, let the sick say I'm well. Well, I can't do that. I'd be lying. No, no, you're not. Why? Because you are not sick. Your body's sick. You understand? Now, don't think I'm just trying to get cute with the semantics or say a certain way. No, I'm, uh, this is a very real reality here, right? Because once you realize that you can never be sick again, then you quit saying, I'm sick. Then if somebody says, well, what about that situation? Oh, that's dealt with. Really? Yeah. You know, how do you feel? Oh, oh, I feel great. My body is acting up. My body isn't feeling too good, but you didn't ask me about that, so we're not going to talk about that. Right? You asked me how I feel. I feel great. Amen? Do you understand? You know, people are going to look at you like, you are crazy. Right? But you know what the good thing is? The conversations will be very short. <laughs> Amen? It's going to be very short. Because they're going to think, I can't even talk to you. You're just, you're just crazy. You're just out there. Now, but now realize, now the thing is, if you are spirit and your body is yours, now I can, I, you know, I got the title to the Tahoe. I got the keys to the Tahoe. I dictate where that car goes, right? I dictate what is done on it. If you know, right now we got the, our team drove it up here, but they don't have the right to just take and do anything they want with it, right? They're not going to take it out and put... 20 inch rims on it and you know as, as they say in the world pimp it all out you know what I'm saying they're not going to do that to it right they better not okay <laughs> and come back with you know flares on the side and a different paint job right why because they don't have the authority to do that that's my car I dictate what is it so if it's under my authority and it's my car I can say car I want this car fixed I want this done to it I want that done to it well if your body belongs to you but it's not you but it's yours then you have the authority to say body you straighten up in the name of Jesus. Devil, you can't live in my body. Cancer, you can't live in my body. Disease, you can't live in my body. You get out of there. That body is for Jesus. I'm presenting my body as a present. To present means to make it a present. I'm presenting my body to Jesus, to God, right? And if I'm going to present it to him, I don't want no devils living in it. I don't want no sickness living in it. Even under the Old Testament, you couldn't present an animal to God that had any blemish, anything wrong with it. Right? So if we're going to present our bodies to God, then our bodies should be whole and clean and holy and without blemish, without spot, all that stuff. Right? So to do that, now we have authority over our body to start telling our body to react correctly and to do what it's supposed to do. Body, be healed in Jesus' name. You act right. You line up with the Word of God. Amen? But that something happens when you start to realize that you are talking to your body. That you are not talking to you. You are talking to your body. Amen? Once you get that, it changes everything. And the beauty of it is, then you can relate to Jesus. Jesus talked to bodies. Jesus talked to water. He talked to trees. He talked to wind. He talked to everything. And guess what? It all obeyed him. And once you realize this, you can realize, I can talk to my body. I can talk to my car. I can talk to my land. I can, I can talk to wind. I can talk to tornadoes and say, no, you won't touch this property. Amen? Now, again, <clears throat> it's funny because I actually, some people on the internet were saying, this guy actually thinks he can command the weather. And I said, well, I actually believe that if I pray, my prayers are answered. If I don't believe that, why would I pray? And he says, whatever you desire, well, that's what you ask. Well, there you go. So I, if I desire good weather, that's what I pray. That's what I speak. Amen? And we've seen it everywhere. And it's funny. I feel sorry for people. You know, I, I've had people tell me, well, you know, I don't believe in healing because I've never seen any. And I said, I'm sorry, you already get out with people that actually are alive. 
You know, you got to get out more, get around people that are walking in this. Amen? Because it gets to be almost like a foreign language. It's hard to believe that people don't see these things happening, especially when you, when you hear about it all the time. Now, we don't have 100% success in every case, on it, and that bugs me, and it bothers me, and it hurts, because when you have a failure, it's a person. But at the same time, the results we do see give me a lot more joy than the sorrow that I would have for any failures. Amen? And we keep pushing and we get better. And honestly, since we've started understanding some of this, it works even better. And so, anyway, the idea here is, notice I'm going to have to send you to break here again. <clears throat> have to. Yep, yep, pretty close. Uh, let's see. Actually, yeah, keep talking. That's what I'm doing. So. <laughs> it just makes you feel better that I'm going to send you to break. You, you think, see, I, I start talking about it, and you feel like you're almost almost in break, so it's, it's easier. So, um, actually, we can stop there. We'll come back in uh, and pick up here when we come back. So go ahead and take a break real quick. And we'll, that, see, I'm, try, I'm getting better at it. I'm trying. Okay. <laughs> so.